So welcome everybody to this second uh, webinar uh, for the security uh, month organized by Verify. This week, we're gonna talk about why you should run your own Bitcoin node, uh, what are the advantages, what are the costs uh, re uh, related to it. And basically we're gonna also go over why uh, the nodes are really important for the Bitcoin network as well. And so for those who don't know, my name is uh, Matt Chick. I'm the marketing director of Verify. We're a Bitcoin consultancy group uh, based in Montreal, we do a lot of uh, work and mandates in that uh, in regards of security, but also in regards of Bitcoin data analysis and other stuff like that. And we also launching currently an OTC platform on which Canadians uh, are going to be able uh, able to buy uh, Bitcoin in the upcoming days. Uh, that's what we have been working on in the past months. So uh, for those who want uh, wants to are uh, interested by that, just let me know and uh, uh, you can join as a beta tester. And for today, uh, so let's start the, the presentation today. And uh, in regards of the security month I, I was talking about, I will talk about it more later at the end of the presentation. So back, back to basics, right? Because we're talking about nodes today. So the, the question is, uh, we have to ask ourselves is what is Bitcoin in reality to respond to that question? So uh, what is Bitcoin? Basically, it's a set of rules. Uh, when Bitcoin was published, it was published under a code. There was a white paper, but the, what started Bitcoin, it's really the code, uh, the, the source code that everybody was able to download and follow the rules. So some of the rules that are really important in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, for example, you all know about the 21 million rules. So what what specifies that uh, Bitcoin is scarce is because uh, it's limited in the, the way it's written in the code. So one of the other important rules that some people may, may be aware of about is the block size. So how many transactions can fit inside a block? Uh, it was always around one megabyte and it was kind of changed because of uh, segwit but it, it didn't change one of uh, of the of the initial protocol rule of the block size of 1 megabyte one of the, the really important rule for money is uh, also not double spending so if i have some bitcoins that you want to send them to some people once you send the bitcoin to one person you can send them back to to another person because it will break uh, the fungibility it will break the fact that um, Bitcoin are, are scarce, so that's another really important rule. Uh, another really important rule is the is the hashing algorithm that miners use for the proof of work. So when miners work, uh, they they do calculation with which are SHA two fifty six calculation, and all the ASICs that are constructed for the purpose of mining are only doing one type of calculation, which is the SHA two fifty six. Another a uh, really important rule is the ECDSA rule, which stands for Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. So that's the way you sign a uh, Bitcoin transaction and uh, and uh, signatures work in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And you also have the halvings, which are specifying how the, the Bitcoins are, are issued during the, the lifetime protocol, the, the, the protocol lifetime. And it, it, is, it is estimated that the last Bitcoin is going to be mined in 2140. So we still have a pretty long way to go. So all these rules uh, make Bitcoin, right? There's uh, tons of them, really technical. So these are more like the, the one understandable by people who are not technical. So basically, Bitcoin is a set of rules, a protocol. So people have to follow uh, these rules in order to participate inside the protocol. So Bitcoin is just a set of rules, right? So what are the conditions to access this network with a bunch of rules uh, that were started initially in 2009? Well, there is no condition. The only condition is that when you enter that protocol and you want to participate uh, via running a Bitcoin full node, that's how you manifest yourself as a participant in the network is by running a full node. Well, the only condition that you can, uh, so you can interact with other people's node is to respect the same rules. So you're all, always on the same basis when transacting, everybody's on the same page regarding uh, the state of the, the blockchain. Everybody is uh, aware that nobody's doing the double spend transaction, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody, Will, uh, will force you or, or nobody will restrain you from running your own Bitcoin node uh, so you can access as a peer and uh, start to interact with the Bitcoin network. So the only role of accessing the Bitcoin network is just to respect the protocol rules. And if you want 
to not respect them while people are just going to reject any uh, type of uh, transaction you want to make that don't respect the initial protocol rules. Uh, there's a distinction to be made in regards of how your wallets interact with the Bitcoin network because your wallet is only an interface uh, that has to go through a Bitcoin full node, which is one of the peers that connects to the other peers of the network. So there's different ways to do that. And every one of them has some trade-offs and uh, what's or not and, uh, and advantages. So I wanted to clarify that because it's really important uh, if you decide to run your own Bitcoin full node. So having a server in the, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, there's going to be different ways in which you can access that node. Uh, but if you don't run a node, there's also ways uh, that you can mitigate the, the loss of privacy and security by using other, uh, uh, other communication techniques. So the most basic uh, way to connect your, your, your wallet to, uh, to the Bitcoin network is through an API. So most of you, if you're using a, a mobile wallet or any type of web wallet, desktop wallets, they are only, they're uh, often connecting to a singular node uh, server that, that is in fact a property of the company that launches the, the, the wallet that you can use for free. So that's kind of their, their business model because when you're connecting your wallet to their node, you're, you're going to be uh, sharing your XPUB, which is your public key, and then they can infer and know all about your addresses that are uh, derived from the, the public key and also know every single transaction that you're going to do in the future uh, because they, they have the main uh, the, the main explainer of your, of your wallet, which is your XPUB, right? So when you when you do that, you're only communicating with one node, and you're gonna only ask inf the information uh, important for your own transaction. So it's really easy uh, to to guess what 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 you want to do with your bitcoins because you're only asking for the transactions that are interesting for you. So API wallets and by themselves, if you're connecting to somebody else's node. Uh, are uh, are really bad for privacy, so it can also uh, bad privacy can lead to uh, bad uh, security because more, if there is more uh, surf, uh, attack surfaces on your bitcoins because people know about you, some people can uh, uh, can associate your uh, IP address with your your uh, bitcoin addresses, so it can become dangerous. And uh, often enough, always almost always like the the API that is going to connect to a uh, to companies' node, while well, they're going to be controlled uh, uh, all the way by the company, so you you may not like it if you want some sovereignty and uh, and uh, autonomy. One way, if you don't want to use an API wallet, but you don't want to run your own node yet, is to use an SPV wallet. So what what is going to do an SPV wallet? And often, uh, when you're going to be using an SPV wallet, it's going to take a longer time in order it to to sync with the network. Why why does it have to sync with the network? It's because it's gonna ask, it's gonna download all the block headers of uh, of uh, the blockchain network. So it's not gonna be like a full node and you're not gonna have the access to all the information of the blocks. You're gonna only uh, download the block headers. So there's a time um, of uh, initial download. So if you wanna use a, a wallet quickly, a mobile wallet quickly, an API wallet might be the way to go. But if you wanna, mitigate the, the possible analysis that could be done over your Bitcoins uh, and your transactions, you should install a SPV wallet. So what does it do exactly? Basically, a SPV wallet is going to ask information about your transaction and other random information about other transaction when uh, when you, you're going to you want to do a request for the Bitcoin network. So in, in that case, since you're asking a lot of information that isn't relevant to your own transaction and funds, it's going to be much more uh, difficult to uh, analyze what exactly are you looking for uh, information. And at the same time, uh, an SPV wallet is going to connect to few uh, to few nodes in the network, and not only one wallet in, uh, and not only one. So uh, it makes it more much more random and difficult to know what you want to do with uh, your your bitcoins or your transaction. So because it has to be synchronized with with the blockchain, it's going to take a few minutes more or a few few hours more to don download the, the the block headers. But in the same time, you, you're benefiting from the fact that it's much more private and uh, and uh, independent. Uh, is the API method to connect 
uh, your wallet to the network a bad thing in itself? No, because you can always use uh, your an API connecting to your own uh, Bitcoin uh, full node, your own server that is going to be communicating with uh, the Bitcoin network. So if you use an API uh, connecting your wallet, your interface, your wallet interface to your own Bitcoin full node, well, you're going to have all the advantages of being private because you're only sharing the information to a server that you control by yourself and being autonomous. You don't rely on someone else infrastructure that could go down, that could uh, that could block you from doing transactions because they're going to have the, the ultimate hold on uh, the access to uh, your Bitcoin uh, uh, activity. But the, the thing is that you can always use your C to to uh, generate your wallet in some in, in another type of wallet, but it's always cumbersome to go over that process if uh, uh, the the API that you connected with uh, doesn't let you do transactions. So these are just clarification to explain why um, uh, what are the differences between how the wallets are going to connect to the Bitcoin network. So today, when when I, I'm going to talk about running your old Bitcoin node, you're going to be connecting to it with an API, right? You're not going to be using the SPV method because the SPV method is when you're using multiple uh, random uh, Bitcoin full nodes that are not yours, but you're using some techniques to anonymize the, the whole thing. So today I'm going to talk about the API, API one. So when people explain a explain Bitcoin as a whole, they often going to talk just about miners and they're going to tell us uh, some things like oh, Bit uh, miners are the one verifying the transaction. And this is absolutely false. Miners, the only thing that they do is to apply the proof of work on a set of uh, on a on a block that has already some valid transaction inside of it. So who validates really the transaction and make sure that they're following the protocol rules is the Bitcoin full nodes. So the Bitcoin full nodes before relay, uh, relaying uh, the uh, a valid tr Bitcoin transaction, they're going to verify if they, uh, if they follow the protocol rules. And then only then they're going to put it in the mempool. And uh, when a miner finds a valid block, he can pick the, the transaction he wants, uh, often depending on how much fees they, they're applied to a single transa transaction. So he's going to construct a block and only apply the, the, the valid proof of work uh, according to the SHA-256 uh, 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 hashing algorithm. So that, that's really an important distinction to make. And it's it's kind of sad because when people explain about Bitcoin, they're only going to talk about miners, but what's really important and uh, the, 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 real, um, the, the real MVPs of, uh, of uh, Bitcoin are Bitcoin full nodes. So the difference is, is that a miner... Uh, a miner is going to use a lot of electricity and uh, uh, is going to do only a single computation, which is the shaft 256. But in in return, he receives a portion of um, of the reward uh, when he finds a valid block because he uh, he uh, he did some work, right? So that's the whole concept of proof of work. Since you have uh, you have some expenses in regard of your electricity and in regards of the capital you, you have put into your mining uh, facility, uh, you need to be recompensated. But Bitcoin full nodes, really, they can run on a really simple computer such as a, uh, such as a Raspberry Pi or, or even on your desktops. And some people are even developing uh, Bitcoin full nodes on cell phones. So it requires much more or less uh, uh, much more or less bandwidth and uh, processing power than a, than a miner, but they are the one verifying that every protocol rules, uh, if, uh, every user in the Bitcoin network follows the protocol rules. So two distinction to be made, but they are equally important. Uh, they couldn't uh, Bitcoin couldn't exist with one uh, missing or another. So where, what are really the benefits of a Bitcoin full node? It, it, so uh, uh, people often are going to be seeking some kind of return on investment when they run a, a, a software in the in the crypto world because they're always uh, used to the fact, oh, if I run a, a, a master node or whatever a kind of thing that exists in the crypto world, they, they should get recompensated. But often enough, uh, we see that these kind of... Uh, this kind of present presentation of you you have to support the network but you're receiving some kind of reward but you don't really know how it, where it comes from uh, it's not sustainable because uh, um, 
people are then dependent on the fact that they, they should get rewarded for action on the network. But in, a, in the Bitcoin world, uh, you, you don't get any reward, uh, monetary reward when you run a full Bitcoin. So the first, so it's really a question of personal, really egoistic way of thinking about when you're using Bitcoin because you only want to seek the, the, the personal advantages it's going to bring you. Of course, some people run Bitcoin full nodes to support the network, but the advantages are mostly personal. Why? Because since you're not dependent on anybody else's server, you're completely autonomous and sovereign within the Bitcoin ecosystem because you don't have to rely on communicating the information you want to communicate to the the Bitcoin network, for example, a transaction when you receive or send a transaction, since you're going to be connected to your own Bitcoin or node, you're much, much more, more autonomous and sovereign. So right, Bitcoin was, uh, it's considered as sovereign money. So if you want to really be sovereign and dependent and your own bank, uh, you want to make sure to run your own Bitcoin nodes so nobody has the, the, the power to censor you, nobody has the, the, the power to block your transaction, et cetera, et cetera. So the f because you're much more autonomous and you're only communicating the, 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 inf the important information to yourself through your node, uh, it also means you're much more private right, and anonymous since you're not sharing uh, some data about your Xbox about your addresses, about your transaction to somebody else, you're going to be holding that information. So it makes, makes you much more private. And a lot of people don't really care about privacy, but for, for those who, who do, uh, it's really important to run your full, full Bitcoin node, uh, full Bitcoin node. So nobody uh, can track your information or analyze it afterwards. And some people often think that a Bitcoin full node in itself brings more security to your Bitcoin, but it's not really the case. It doesn't add like extra and uh, extra encryption or uh, extra, I don't know, uh, just security wise for your Bitcoin themselves. When when we talk about security, we all most often talk about the fact that you have to protect your seed, about multi multi signature scheme, about a lot of stuff like that. But since you're more private and autonomous when using your Bitcoin network, you're not sharing as much information. There is less uh, threat surfaces for your Bitcoin because less people know about the fact that you have some or, you're, or you, that you are interacting with the Bitcoin network. Uh, so it brings kind of security with, uh, with that sense. So it's really important. And we also have proof uh, that Bitcoin nodes work uh, through the battles uh, that happened in 2017 in regards of uh, the way uh, Bitcoin was supposed to scale. So for those who are maybe new to this, in 2017, there was a big debate uh, going on in regards of should we make, um, should we make the, the blocks bigger in order to bring more scalability to Bitcoin. So there was two camps, basically. There was the, the big blockers that wanted to make the blocks bigger and it was mostly market participants such as uh, exchanges and uh, miners, uh, uh, miners conglomerate that wanted that because since you're, you're able to put more transaction inside a singular block, you can recall more fees in the end. Uh, so that was their logic. And it's kind of the easy, easy way uh, to go because you just make the blocks bigger and it's that. But what will, what will have, have to happen in that case is a hard fork, which means that one of the initial rules of the uh, of the Bitcoin network that I talked previously, which are, for example, the, the one megabyte block will have to be changed permanently. And a new version of the Bitcoin software or Bitcoin full node will have been uh, taking over the network and it will have split the, the, the nodes, uh, basically making two, um, two networks uh, one that don't agree with the one megabyte rule and want to make the block bigger, the block bigger, uh, and the ones that wanted to conserve the the initial rules of Bitcoin that believe that the fact that uh, it's 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 the way that it is, it's uh, why Bitcoin has some value. So we could imagine that it was really a stressful time because you had all these companies, uh, big big conglomerates, they were meeting in private meetings and. Uh, at trying to take over the Bitcoin uh, and they had money, they had influence. But on the other hand, who 
was running the, the Bitcoin full nodes, it's the users, right? The users that just wanted to, to run a little Bitcoin node on a Raspberry Pi. And they were running the Bitcoin software that they were deciding to, to run. Nobody was forcing them to run the big block uh, the the big block uh, um, uh, software. Nobody was uh, forcing them to run the regular Bitcoin Core uh, software full node. So it was a question. It, well, there was basically two movements. So one of the proposition that was uh, proposed instead of big block was SegWit, which is what was a way to kind of split uh, the way. Uh, the, the data is considered in a transaction. So you have now SegWit data, so which stands for segre segregated witness and, and uh, non-SegWit data in a transaction. And because you can separate both, you have some, some part of the transaction, uh, some parts of the transaction that are outside of the block and not, it don't have the same weight in regards of how much space they, they take inside a block. So with that, with that method, they could, uh, they could make more they could place more transaction inside a block and at the same time it was necessary for uh, the lightning network uh, which was the, the way most of the bitcoin uh, people believe bitcoin should scale is by subsequent layers of protocols building on top of it so it's a really complicated story and uh, the, so the, it's the, there is this whole movement of uisf and no 2 x which were like basically uh Bitcoin full node users advocating for the fact they're gonna just run a specific software, which was the the SegWit software, and uh, it was really a battle between the big blockers that wanted to 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 change the nature of Bitcoin and the ones that wanted to conserve it this way. And uh, um, so, for those who want to learn more about this, it's it's kind of like the Independence Day of Bitcoin. I, I put it the link down below uh, when we did the a celebration about that in montreal when uh, it was permitted so uh, it's a really complicated story but it basically proves that bitcoin full nodes have the power in the bitcoin network and not the miners uh, because the miners have the ability to maybe try to do a 51 percent attack but it doesn't really matter because a 51 percent attack it's only like a reversal of a few blocks and even then and uh, none of them has, are going to do that because it's it's really expensive and if they fail it's just like a uh, it's just uh, a waste of energy and uh, and time. But the most important thing is that miners can change the, the, the rules of Bitcoin that makes Bitcoin. So that was kind of the proof that Bitcoin full nodes are important and uh, a crucial part of the network. And they are the one checking everybody, making sure that everybody follows the rules. So just uh just a little notes on that is in regards how how bitcoin evolves so when you want to bring a new protocol update or improvement inside the bitcoin protocol uh it's gonna have to follow the soft fork principle and be backward compatible with all the previous versions of bitcoin so so for example even then for the people that de decided to not run segwit they were still able to communicate with the rest of the nodes uh, even if there are some problems uh, in certain specific things, but you still can interact with the network. So it's making sure that the network won't split each time that you want to bring an update or fix a bug. And it's really important. So that way, when you don't have any rules, any of the initial rules changing, uh, through the time, it's going to be even much harder to change one of the initial rules of Bitcoin. So uh, there's a term for that. We say that they ossify in some kind of sense. So as more layers of subsequent protocols build on top of it, such as liquid, such as lightning networks, such as everything else that is built on top, well, it's going to be much harder to change one of the initial rules of Bitcoin and nobody wants that. So nobody wants, for example, to make uh, two times more bitcoins it wouldn't make sense bitcoin will uh, uh people will lose um uh, their perception of value of scarcity if bitcoin changes and it's not the the so it's really important that that's the way bitcoin should should evolve so what are the costs and requirements of a full node i talked a bit about it it's really not that much uh and it's becoming easier and easier with uh a lot of companies working on some softwares uh, to make it even 
with a pretty interface because right now it still requires some uh, technical knowledge in Linux and uh, in Bitcoin Core and running a full node. But basically, you can run it on a mini computer such as Raspberry Pi. So you need around 300 gigawatts of hard drive space, uh, one gigabyte of random access memory. Why? Because when you're downloading um, the, the blockchain from other nodes, uh, it's going to verify each single UTXO. So th that's the way Bitcoin works. It's not through a, a, a credit and a debit balances by having singular coins that are protected with some uh, uh, with some scripts and you and you unlock that script with your private keys. So it's going to make sure that every one of these scripts were done the, the right way by uh, by processing it. So one gig of RAM might be really slow to to download it all, but uh, it's 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 still enough to do it in a relative a good amount of time. And of course, you need uh, some uh, a good uh, internet connection if you want uh, to download it fast and be uh, on sync with the others uh, as fast as possible. So how many nodes there are at the moment? So um, people are gonna often look at the fact that they're at the public node. So, but in fact, there's much more because a lot of people are uh, will be running the, their Bitcoin full nodes through the Tor network, which means that they, it won't show uh, nowhere, and they, they will be only uh, listening and not sharing the information back. So there is a there is a Bitcoin Core developer called Luke Dash Jr. Uh, he's really uh, he's really advanced in uh, networks and uh, everything like that. So he has uh, a software that that uh, calculates approximately how many there is, and at the moment, right now, there is uh, around forty three thousand. So uh, so it's 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 by far the 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 cryptocurrency protocol that has the most. Other can other cryptocurrencies that have only tens or maybe hundreds of them, but Bitcoin is the only one like that, and this number has varied a lot during the last years so for example during the uisf battle so the the block the block size debate as uh, since people were running uh, bitcoin full nodes in order to to show their um their commitment and support for uh, keeping it as it is there was around uh, 250 uh, bitcoin full nodes so it varies uh, depending on the time but uh, of course this is uh, it's really important uh to to know how many there is so if we back, if we go back, I have a small demo for you. So the presentation is almost over, and in the presentation, I inputted some uh, for those who want to start a Bitcoin full node. Uh, uh, there's a nice article here showing all the possible commands that you're gonna be using uh, to explore all the functionalities of your node. Uh, so I'll be doing a few of them today. Uh, but it's a great article that can go over it um, pretty easily. So for the purpose, I don't know if, okay, I'm going to be showing my console. Sorry, just a second. Yeah, so everybody sees. So uh, for the purpose of the presentation, I sp spin off a uh, little Bitcoin full nodes uh, at my house. So it's currently connected and it was syncing. Uh, it was syncing before. So we're just going to make sure with a simple command that it's effectively the moment. Uh, so you can do that by doing bitcoin.cli get blockchain info. And you're going to have all sort of information showing you uh if it's working or not so you have you have basically um the information that is important for us showing that we are sync with the network so how many blocks there are and uh how many headers since they are uh, since they are the same it's it's meaning that we are effectively uh synchronized with the network at the moment so every blocks that comes in it's going to get automatically uh, joined to the the blockchain uh and uh, we can interact with it uh, as it is, because you cannot connect your 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 wallet to your node if it's not in sync, and it's going to be kind of uh, useless if uh, if it doesn't have the latest information. 
So once we have that, oh yeah, just one one thing I, I forgot. So basically, once you have a Bitcoin full node running, for example, on a computer or a, or a, or a, or a, or a, well, a computer. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you're gonna have to find it on the local network uh, of your house if you run it at your house. So, uh, so the way you do that is by connecting, for example, a, a screen to to it, and uh, with the, the command line IP address, you can find the where is the node, where is the node situated in your local network. So, for example, you can find the information here. One uh, and that's going to be really important once you want to connect your wallet to your own Bitcoin full node, right? So we're going to keep that in mind. I already have it noted somewhere, but it's just a question of showing you that once you run your full Bitcoin node, well, then you need to find it where it is in your Bitcoin uh, in your local uh, network, and once you have that information, you can access it and uh, interact with it, right? So are a few nice comments that we can explore at the at the moment. Um, you have, by example, uh, for, for, for example, uh, Bitcoin CLI uh, get mining info, right? So you're gonna have the difficulty, the network hash, uh, the so uh, all, all the information needed. For example, if you want to develop a Bitcoin application and uh, or. Uh, uh, or whatsoever it's going to be possible through your node. And when we were doing this right now, this is a completely independent action, right? Since I'm connected to my own node, nobody can lie to me or intercept the fact that I ask this information to my, uh, uh, to my node and he shared it back. So it's really important that in that experience that I'm showing you right now, it's completely sovereign and, um, and uh, independent. So of course you can get some transactions. You can get some uh, information about transactions, about about blocks, about anything uh, anything you want. Basically, or uh, we can, for example, get some information about the peers. So the other nodes that we connected to in order to retrieve the information of of the blockchain. So you're gonna have all these bunch of information really important for uh, for those who are technical, etc. So it's gonna show you uh, to which. Uh, to which peers you're connected, etc. So yeah, it's kind of fun, you know. You you can run some commands; it shows you numbers, but uh, you know it, it doesn't really appeal to to the people that are not technical. So what you can do uh, concretely with uh, that kind of software that you will run on your Bitcoin uh, on your computer is by connecting your wallet uh, to your Bitcoin full node. That's the whole purpose because because a, a Bitcoin full node in itself. It doesn't really serve you if you don't verify and uh, validate all the transaction and uh, un make sure that you're on the right uh, you're on the right chain if you're not connecting your wallet to it. So it's really important once you have one uh, to connect to it, so so you're sure that you're completely independent. So um, once you have that, you have a. I'm going to show you Electrum, which is one of the. Um, one of the most known Bitcoin wallets out there, always recommended by Bitcoin OGs and what so not because of his high security standard. And of course, one of the things that I believe that is stopping people from running a full Bitcoin node is the fact that the UI and the user experience uh, is uh, still horrible at the moment. There are some alterna alternatives such as my node. Uh, Casa node, but they're still not perfect. Uh, we also have a project in that regard, so uh, we we want to make that experience easier and make people understand um, why they should run a node and and communicate them the the benefits that they could have by running one. So yeah, you have uh, you have this uh, interface, which is a basic uh, basic wallet, and. Once you have a Bitcoin full node running, you can go to tools or uh, would see in, in French in, in the neck, in the network uh, part of it, you're going to, uh, at the beginning, uh, you're going to be, you're going to have something like this, right? So it's, you, you have to, since, since you, there's no Bitcoin full nodes running automatically when you run an Electrum it's going to connect to a, other Electrum servers. So, uh, you know that you're not connected to yours. So once once you have one, you can input the 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 address that was previously 
does everybody know? Uh, yeah, everybody sees. Um, you can input the IP address I showed you uh, a, few, a few, few minutes ago when you find it on your local network. And it's really simple as that. You just input the IP address of your Bitcoin full node on the network interface. And since I'm running the computer on the local network, it's going to be connecting to it automatically. And how you make sure that it's connected while well, there's going to be a green light showing up um, telling you that you are. So you have this wallet that is completely independent, connected to your own. And uh, well, you, you're real Bitcoiner now if you do that. So so it's kind of fun and, uh, and, uh, and useful to know that you can be completely sovereign when using Bitcoin. And uh, if, uh, if there, so I hope that in the future, some companies are going to be still developing uh, to make it even easier and less clicks before you can run one. Uh, just get let me get back to my presentation real quick. So that was basically it. It was a small demo, but just to show that uh, running a full node is, isn't that scary uh, as it is, uh, as it can look. Um, the best way to start is by going to bitcoin.org and you, you will have a lot of demos and uh, tutorials explaining how to do it. And you can always contact me if you have any more questions. So uh, thank you for everybody that joined. It's always really nice to, to have these little little webinars with you. And uh, so, just a reminder that this presentation was done in the in the in the context of a security month we're doing right now. So the next one will be on the 9th of June um, about uh, more more about confid confidentiality. I didn't I talk a bit about the fact running uh, a Bitcoin full node through Tor is, is making you more private. So I will go into more details uh, with that on the next week. And also, I will be talking about coin join and uh, other stuff like that, and other good practice practices in order to conserve your privacy uh, within the Bitcoin world. So, uh, for those who who will like it, uh, you can always follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and follow me on uh, Twitter as well. Uh, that would be great. And the last presentation uh, about in the security month will like compensate all the previous. Um, presentation on the wads, the nodes, and, uh, and anonymity with a cold storage presentation. So I hope everybody learned something and uh, uh, thank you for joining. I'll be taking questions now and comments and, uh, and uh, everything. Oh, uh, thank you, Mathieu. Uh, yeah, uh, in regards of the question of Andrew, what uh, what about the idea of running a Lightning node? Uh, well, at the moment, Lightning uh, Lightning network, the Lightning network is still, I will consider, uh, experimental phase. So, uh, but when you're using the Lightning Network is always better if you do it with your own node, of course. Um, so yeah, I don't have anything against the idea of running a, a Lightning node. It, it could be uh, an interesting presentation as well. Um, sure. So uh, yeah, that's... Uh... Actually, I, I, talk a bit, I talked a bit about uh, Lightning uh, Lightning uh, Network uh, wallets uh, in my uh, mm -hmm. wallet presentation, and I was I was saying that of course you shouldn't conserve a lot of bitcoins on them because they're still pretty experimental, mm -hmm. and still you and still uh, because of the fact you can conserve the the last channel state easily. A lot of people lost their funds, but you know if you if you want to play with it, have like put twenty dollars of worth of bitcoin on it, uh, there's no problem, right? So it's just a question that. 
we should still consider Lightning Network as experimental, in my opinion. But uh, they always create tools and uh, experimentation with that with that network as well. And thank you for those who um, who spelled the 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 acronyms of USF and no 2 x Yeah. So Mathieu asked, how about running a pruning node for those who either can afford all the hardware or just want to experiment? How does that help from a sovereignty uh, perspective? So a prune node has all the advantages of sovereignty. Uh, in fact, once you have downloaded all the blockchain and verify all the UTXOs, uh, you don't really need it. You just only the last few states, uh, last few states of it. And for example, there are some projects looking into the, the the fact of pruning your node to to its maximum so maybe even um, running on a one megabyte blockchain you only keep like the the crucial information uh, so i think that once you you do the initial download and prune it afterwards there's absolutely no problem uh, not keeping the blockchain it doesn't really serve you you just wanted to validate that the last state of the UTXO set is uh, is correct and that you'll be following it at, the, at that moment, but you don't really need the, the, the whole blockchain and store it all the time. So uh, that's a really good question, but I think it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do much in regards of uh, sovereignty. It's, it, it's the same, basically. But the problem is that if you don't have the hardware required at, uh, in the first place, uh, for example, in, in regards of the disk space, uh, well, you know, you have to kind of find a way to do it. Um, but uh, the, I think I think since hardware is always uh, going down in price and uh, and uh, and efficiency, uh, we won't have that problem in a few years. But some some are advocating such, such as Luke Dash Jr. Uh, he's even crazier than uh, the the other people. He he want he advocates for the three hundred. Uh, kilobytes uh, block so three times smaller almost uh, more than three times smaller because he believes that um, the requirements of running your own uh, or your own node uh, for your hardware is uh, is really high at the moment so you know you have a lot of uh, opinions in that regards Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I kind of already asked most of the questions uh, I wanted to ask last time, uh, the French one, but uh, now that you mentioned the uh, Luke Dash Jr. Uh, limit uh, that he wants to bring it down to 300k, uh, do you guys really think that that's like uh, something that would like uh, be uh, of help uh, for people? Or what would be like uh, the issue that Luke Dash Jr. is seeing with the current block size? Is it that uh, it takes too long to sync? Uh, uh, let me know. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the question is really great. I think that the, the, the debate is much more profound and it has like multiple layers. Uh, basically, what, what Luke Dash Jr. is saying is that SegWit was already kind of a change. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't like SegWit. He said that it's, uh, it was actually a block size increase. And in some ways, it kind of was an... Uh, we don't tell that to uh, to other uh, not non technical Bitcoin users, but in fact, the the real fact is that yeah, Segwit was kind of a block increase, just just the one that is compatible with other older Bitcoin full nodes, right? So he he was completely against Segwit. He wants smaller blocks because he believed that. Uh, he believes that 85% of Bitcoin users at least uh, should have should run their Bitcoin full node, and uh, so the fact that he wants 85% of the people at least to run a full Bitcoin node, uh, the requirements to run one one in his opinion should be really low, such as 300 ki ki uh, kilobytes. But I don't believe it will never be uh, it will be taken seriously uh, ever. Uh, since it's 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 too radical as a as a 
as a this uh, as a as an opinion and a, a way to propose to to change the the Bitcoin network. And so I believe that there's other ways in which we can help um, making running a node easier. So what one of the strategy of Bitcoin developers is to making is trying to fit as much as transaction as possible inside a singular block uh, in order to increase scalability by making the transaction smaller and more efficient. So that's why, for example, you have SegWit, you have batching, you have all the other all these other techniques to, to make the transaction smaller in size. Uh, so that's kind of a good way to think about it. I think instead of like trying to play with the block size, I, I believe that it should stay as it is and we should use other techniques, other optimization techniques uh, to play with transactions, for example, uh, to reduce that problem. And is it is is it really because uh, blocks are one megabyte big that people don't run a full Bitcoin node? I don't I don't think so. Uh, we actually have been doing a lot of market research in that regards and a lot of people are simply don't have the time. They don't have the confidence of doing it the right way. Uh, they don't know about it. They don't know what are the benefits of it. So I think that Luke Dash Jr. has a really like Bitcoin core developer's view of the world. And um, he doesn't, uh, he, he won't, for example, mention the UX or whatever. He only cares about the, uh, the 300 kilobytes. But I think it's an interesting debate. But... Uh, that's that's my take on it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, Luke Dash Jr. I have a lot of respect for him, but from what I understood, he seems to be like a bit of an autistic type, you know, and uh, he's not taking into consideration uh, what the, the regular uh, people, you know, like uh, the, the technical challenges to, to run a node. You know, even me, who knows a little bit about running computers and setting up a OS, is, uh, took me a while to, like, finally get interested to the point to like uh, take a few hours aside to like learn to source the parts I needed and everything else so uh, I can only imagine for people like uh, you know my parents or even friends of mine you know like have like barely any interest in like maybe they don't even have a desktop computer nowadays because they're all running like uh, the, their computing experience is coming through a tablet or a phone you know so uh, the other thing I, I remember hearing recently was um, there seems to be a new phone that came out or is coming out on the market that may be able to run a full node. I don't know if it's uh, Samsung, LG, or HTC. I think it's one of those big three Korean companies that has it. And uh, yeah, and, and the other thing, a comment I wanted to make is from what I understood, uh, if uh, uh, Bitcoin Core were to take Luke Dash Jr.'s uh, you know, like uh, idea and you go down to 300 K, uh, it becomes uh, irreversible after uh, once you can make the blocks bigger and do a soft fork. But I heard that once you go down and you reduce the block size, there's no going back. Then you would have to hard fork it and it would cause like a total complete fiasco like we had like uh, during the uh, Bitcoin cash uh, hard fork uh, drama. So that's it. Yeah, I, I believe the same. Like, it wouldn't make sense. Nobody, nobody's really taking that seriously. Like everybody, like really appreciates what what uh, Luke is doing for Bitcoin. But uh, as you said, he he's uh, he's a bit on the autistic syndrome uh, spectrum. I, I would say so. So so yeah, he has uh, strong opinions, but I, I don't think they they really take him seriously that much. Uh, there's uh, Scott Lyons asking. I'm running full nodes, but I'm not using the wallet. I am still testing and want to make sure I can restart the wallet. Do you think it's safe for us to trust the wallet? So um, there's few questions inside of that. You mean which wallet? Are you talking about Electrum? Are you talking about your your wallets? Uh, your wallet you're using at the moment? If you if you want to really trust the wallet, the software you're downloading, uh, you should build build it from source. And verify all the the cryptographic signatures of it because if somebody, for example, uh, makes you download a, a fake version, a spooked version, uh, ah, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so the Bitcoin Core wallet. Um, personally, I wouldn't use the Bitcoin Core wallet. Um, 
I will use Electron because it has like more functionality and uh, so you can always run your your Bitcoin full node and then uh, and then use use Electron for example or use Cold Card a hard wallet to connect to it. So there's multiple ways depending on what you want to do. Uh, but if you want to trust the wallet, no, no matter what wallet, uh, you should always uh, build it from source. Um, so that would be my sim, like a easy answer. Uh, but if you have any more like detailed question in regards of your setup, I, I can always uh, help you. And let me just send in the chat uh, an analysis we did on on uh, bitcoin wallets uh so you can choose always the best for yourself uh, sorry you can show it as well So uh, here you, you have like a, a comparison of multiple uh, software Bitcoin wallets. And of course, Bitcoin Core, Core is recommended. So I said personally, I wouldn't do it because I prefer Electrum, but uh, it's totally secure and you should trust it if you build it the right way and in a good uh, environment. So you, you can definitely be trusted uh, without problem. And you have all these others that you can connect uh, your node to. Uh, that was like a really important criteria for us is if a wallet doesn't let you uh, connect to your own node, uh, it shouldn't be your wallet because it's always gonna be connecting to somebody else and you don't have the option to, to use another source. So uh, you can always use that tool we have here uh, in order to, to uh, choose your wallet. But as I said, if you have uh, more specific questions uh, and want to talk about it, your setup, uh, you can always contact me. So I don't know if there's some last questions, some comments. Not, not really any questions, but I uh, just wanted to like, uh, well, sort of a question. Uh, did, did you guys have any idea when uh, you guys might uh, start doing uh, the meetups uh, live at, uh, mm -hmm. where, what was that coffee shop you were doing it at Not Notham House? Did you guys get any news from them if they're reopening soon or if they're already mm -hmm. reopened? Uh, we didn't... Uh... We didn't look into it uh, really at the at the moment uh, because we were concentrated on uh, other other things. Um, but yeah, I, uh, my my opinion would be that as soon as we can, we're gonna do a a big fucking party <laughs> for yeah. all the Bitcoiners. Uh, we're because we're we're missing uh, everybody, and I think people, uh, you know, it's it's never the same uh, through the webinars. I think it's bullshit the fact that people are, uh, are going to be only working from home i think people need that 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 uh, contact and it's also more private if you have uh, just a conversation uh between uh, bitcoiners in a in a private space you know so uh, as soon as we can we're going to organize something for sure um i don't know when when that's going to be exactly but uh but yeah uh i hope soon as possible maybe we should do like a Illegal gathering somewhere. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, we're gonna find something, and uh, as soon we can, as soon as we can, we are gonna do it. And uh, so, Matsu asked, uh, "How about the OTC does for a brief reason?" Re really like to hear both more about it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, because of the the pandemic, uh, you know, we we saw that there was a, a big interest. For Bitcoin, and uh, because of the fact that we couldn't really uh, operate the same way with our existing clients in regards of the security consultancy and everything, so we started developing uh, the platform in uh, 
uh, with uh, by by also being uh, connected to the bull Bitcoin uh, uh, backend. So uh, that that is going to be launched in a few days. Uh, we're currently testing the last uh, features of it, and the goal of it and the goal is it's, it's going to be a OTC desk in the beginning, but uh, to turn it in, into a, an application as fast as possible and to automate all the steps uh, as fast as possible. But it, it will be live in a, in the upcoming week or next two weeks. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, I knew you guys were already working on uh, the uh, exchange, uh, but uh, I didn't know that uh, your motivation for it was uh, the whole uh, craziness that happened during the pandemic that uh, basically people were having actually a hard time like going to even otc places of uh, these uh, bitcoiners uh, businesses uh, they were like there many of them were their atms where the atms were they were closed and if you wanted to go to like the exchanges uh, uh, their uh, business hours were uh, not the, the the usual and it was starting to get to a point where maybe uh, they were going to start controlling people coming into the city uh, if they had no business going to the city, you know. So, so yeah. yeah, it's a it's a good idea. Yeah, and there was some record uh, volume sales in a lot of platforms uh, because I believe I believe that people are seeking something new uh, mm -hmm. to hold in their portfolio, something that that has some truth in it in a world where. You know, you can hardly distinguish between what is true or not, and what is, you know, what is true or not. So, um, so yeah, thanks for asking, uh, Mathieu. And I, I, Mathieu has a, a another OTC desk based in uh, Quebec City. It's called uh, ValueX. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have a really great service as well. And the way I see it really is, uh, right now, it's not a question of sharing the pie, but, but baking a bigger pie together because like it's just the beginning of bitcoin so i know i know we're gonna be in competition there Mathieu, but i hope we're gonna stay friends <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh I don't know if that's all. I think that's all, right? Nobody has something to say again. Exactly. All right. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And I see you next week for those who want to join. And uh, the, the presentation will be available on the Bitcoin YouTube. Uh, channel, uh, Montreal YouTube channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.